July and welcome to our service here today at the King of Grace. Uh, today we celebrate the strength of our nation, the fact that we were strong enough, powerful enough, mighty enough to become an independent nation. Uh, and in our service, uh, we're talking about strength and weakness, about how in the upside down kingdom of God, how he operates in this world and in our life, that so often things that look like strength are actually weakness, and things that look like weakness are actually strength. Uh, and how in our life, anything we accomplish, anything good, that any good results that come about, uh, anything that we are good at, especially in our faith life, is only attributable to the fact that we are connected to the power source. We are connected uh, to, to our, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The power that, that he gives to us when he unites himself to us in faith. Uh, so may we be uh, blessed and, and fed through his word here this morning. Uh, we'll begin with our opening prayer. O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we're assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. Please open our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Through the preaching of your word, teach us to repent of our sins, to believe in Jesus in life and death, and to grow every day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is, O Christ, our true and only life.
begotten Son to die for us, and on the basis of Jesus' work, forgives us all our sins. To all who believe in his name, he gives the power to become the children of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Grant this, Lord, to us all. Amen. Is not without honor 
except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own house. He cannot do any miracles there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went around the villages teaching. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their money belts. They were to put on sandals, but not to wear two coats. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that area. Any place that will not receive you or listen to you as you leave there, shake off the dust that is under your feet as a testimony against them. He went out and preached that people should repent. He also drove out many demons. They anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the gospel of the crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let's confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father of Just 
always annoying him. But it was there for a reason. It was there so that God would always remind Paul where Paul's power came from. Paul was a great preacher. He got to do a lot of really cool things. He was a, a very talented guy. But that thorn in the flesh always reminded him that, that God's power is made perfect and weakness, that God's power is enough for us. So Paul got to preach. He got to talk to a lot of people. He traveled a, a lot of places. The whole time he remembered, it's not about me. It's not about my strength and what I can do. It's all about how much my God has blessed me, about how he has given me his power to, to do these things. So what about us in our life? There are going to be times when you guys are frustrated, right? Trying to open a pickle jar. Oh, even I struggle with that sometimes. But even sometimes bigger things. Maybe there's going to be something in school that's hard for you. That's a struggle for you. That's really hard to do. Maybe in the future when you guys have a job, there's going to be something that's really hard for you guys to accomplish. Something difficult for you to do. Today what God wants you to always remember is that he is enough for us, okay? That no matter how much we struggle, no matter how weak we are, how we how we just are, are so difficult to do what we want to do, Jesus tells us, I am enough for you. Because when we are when we know that, when we remember Jesus, we know that He died on the cross for us. We know that He covers up all of our sin, and that because of Jesus we can go to heaven. We know that in baptism He's made us His own dear children. He said, You are so important. I love you so much, and I want you to be with me forever in heaven. And so he gave us his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross to make sure that happens. And he gave us this gift of faith to know that, that Jesus is enough for us. So Jesus isn't going to take away all of your problems, okay? You guys are still going to be weak. You guys probably aren't strong enough to push a car right now, right? Just like I wasn't if it wasn't on a hill when I was four. Uh, but throughout your life, remember that Jesus is enough for us. Because even as we struggle, even as we are weak, he's right there with us. He's by our side, reminding us always that his grace, his love, and his forgiveness are enough for us. So throughout our whole life, let's remember that, right? That Jesus is enough for us. And let's say a prayer to thank Jesus for being enough. Dear Jesus, so often we know that, that we are weak, that we are not strong enough, we're not good enough to do the things that we want to do, and this can make us frustrated and mad. Remind us always that, that your grace is enough. Your love is enough. You are enough for us in our life. Uh, Lord, we know that through you all things are possible. But we also know that, that we want to accomplish everything that we want in our life. Because you, you, you remind us so often uh, that our, our power, our strength, our accomplishments don't come from us. But they are a gift from you. And they are you working through us. Uh, Lord, remind us of this all our life. Remind us to, to trust in you. Uh, to be weak in you. Because then we know that we are strong. Thank you, everybody, even in that. We'll continue with our sermon again.
Christ. Amen. As a pastor, I have not had to uh, go through very many job interviews. We don't interview for calls, we don't interview for our positions. Uh, so it's not something I'm super familiar with. I've done a few in my life. I worked at True Valley for a while. I was a bartender over at Wyzetta Country Club for many years. And then through seminary, I, uh, I worked as a maintenance man at, a, at an apartment complex. So I've seen a few, but I'm not an expert or the guy that you want to come to for advice when it comes to job interviews. Uh, but one that's kind of a staple, a question that interviewers ask is what are your strengths? Right? And that, that one is a great question to get. Uh, and it's an easy one. If you want to brag about yourself, if you want to, to make yourself look good in someone else's eyes, that's a great question to answer. Talk about that one for a long time. Because you can say anything, and then the person interviewing you has no way of knowing if it's the truth. All right, I'm a really hard worker. I, 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 I take a lot of initiative. All right, I'm, a, I'm a great team player. You can make yourself sound, sound awesome, and there's no way for them to know if it's true or not. But the question that comes up sometimes after that is what are your weaknesses? That was a harder one to, to handle. It's hard to make yourself look good when you're talking about your weaknesses. It's hard to boast about yourself when you're telling someone some, some things that you're not good at. So one strategy people recommend sometimes is to, to emphasize a strength to the point where it becomes a weakness, right? I work so hard that sometimes I just get too caught up in my work and I spend too many hours in the office. I'm, I'm, I'm just too diligent of a worker. I take too much initiative and take on too many pro projects, right? You can say I'm, I'm too kind. I, I, I pay too much attention to detail. So my strategy is to, to say I'm so strong, I'm so good, that sometimes people can perceive this as, as a weakness. Now our text today, Paul talks a lot about weakness, especially one big one that, that he struggled with. In our text, it reminds us about how God works in us as well. So we talk often about how God's kingdom in this world is one that's upside down. It's opposite from what we would expect. And that applies to our weaknesses too. So Paul here, he's writing to the Corinthians and he encourages us to God's people, to not be focused so much on our strengths. To not hang our hat on what we are good at, on what we are, our, our talents might be. But it's said to boast about our connection to Christ, to hang our hat on that. Because when that connection is there, then we can celebrate our weaknesses. Because they are so great that with Christ they actually become a strength. So let's read our text from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 10. Once again, I invite you to rise for me. <coughs> I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. So I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was carried up to the third heaven. Whether in the body I do not know or out of the body, I do not know God knows. And I know that such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know God knows, was carried up into paradise and heard inexpressible words that a man cannot possibly speak. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on, on my own behalf, I will not boast, except about my weaknesses. Indeed, if I wanted to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from doing this, so that no one will think more highly of me than what, they, what he sees in me or hears from me. Therefore, to keep me from becoming arrogant due to the extraordinary nature of these revelations, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, so that I would not become arrogant. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he would take it away from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, because my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will be glad to boast all the more in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may shelter me. That is why I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then am I strong. Dear Heavenly Father, these words are yours, and so we know that they are the truth. We ask that you would increase our faith through them. Amen. So 
Paul here in the beginning of our text does uh, what is sometimes referred to as a, as a humble brain. Uh, maybe you've heard people do this. Uh, you say, uh, you know, Bob was really good at football in high school. And he says, no, I wasn't that good. My state records only only stood for, for five or six years. That's kind of a humble brain. Where you, where you say something negative about yourself or where you kind of put yourself down, but for the purpose of, of bringing attention to some, some pretty cool features, facts about yourself. So Paul does that a little bit in our text, because this, this certain man in Christ, who got to see these awesome visions, who got to be carried up into heaven, that's Paul. He's talking about himself in that entire section. He's talking about a vision that he got to see, this is a, a wonderful revelation from the Lord. So he's saying this was a, an awesome thing to see. And it, it would be cool, wouldn't it, to be able to see heaven, to be able to know exactly what awaits us in paradise. Paul says he doesn't know if it was just a vision. He doesn't know if, if God actually took, took him physically into heaven. He was so overwhelmed. He was so caught up in what he was seeing and what he was hearing. Words that are, are inexpressible by humans that he didn't, he didn't focus on himself at all. But what a cool thing to experience. What a cool thing, uh, a cool gift from God. Something indeed that, that he should be able to boast about, that he should be able to brag about. Guess what I got to see? When it comes to Paul bragging, that's not the only thing he can boast about, because that wasn't his only vision. We know about the first one, where, where Saul is on his way to Damascus, and, and he's persecuting Christians, and, and then he gets to meet Jesus, after Jesus had ascended into heaven. Jesus appears to Paul right there in the road, and he says, hey, you're persecuting me, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Instead of persecuting me and my people, go and preach to me. To, to the entire world. So Paul got to see that too. He got to meet Jesus in the flesh while he was on the earth. Another awesome thing. On top of that, Paul was a talented man. Preached to thousands upon thousands of people. The, the, the words that came from his mouth took root in the hearts of, of so many people. Faith was created through this, this seed of faith that was planted through him. And so many people came to faith through that. Throughout the, throughout the world. And so Paul had a lot to boast about. And he knows all of this. So there's some humor in this. But he says, if I wanted to boast, I, I could. Because I'd be telling you the truth. He's saying, I, I, I have experienced a lot of great things. I have been blessed in so many ways by my God. And I can tell you about my visions that were so awesome. Which, by the way, were amazing. I can tell you about all my accomplishments, which are a lot. Or I can tell you about my talents, which are, are many. But I'm not going to tell you about that. I'm not going to boast about any of you. So it is a little bit of a, of a humble brag, but it's one with a purpose. Paul says, yeah, I, have, I have every right to point to my strengths, but I'm not going to do it. Instead, I'm going to boast in my weaknesses. And he says that this is a benefit not just for him, but for the people that he was serving. He didn't want people to look at him and say, wow, Paul is so awesome. Paul is so strong and so great. I want to attach myself to Paul. I want to be around Paul. I want to be close to him. Instead, when people look at Paul, he said, I want people to see Jesus. I want people to look at me and to say how great God is. How powerful is Jesus working through the life of this man? So he says, I want no one to think more highly of me than what they see in me or hear from me. Paul says, I want everyone to look at me and to see Jesus. I want everyone to look at me and to see the power of God. I want everyone to hear me and to hear Christ and Him crucified. Not to focus on, on the person, but on the message. Paul says, from every encounter that people have with me, I want them to go in the way knowing Jesus. It's sinful human nature. It's a difficult thing to fight against, isn't it? And so when you are in a situation like Paul, or he is incredibly blessed, or he is, is successful in his missionary journeys, where, where he went to the right schools, is known by the right people, everything is going his way. It would be hard for him to not get a big head. Our heads, our egos inflate so quickly. Our simple nature wants to, to focus on our strengths, not our weaknesses. We don't want to think about our weaknesses. We want to cover them up. We want to hide them in front of other people. We want to do the things that, that, we're, that we're good at because we want 
that, that praise. We want those, those accolades from others. We want other people to recognize the strengths that we have. So God helped Paul. He helped him not get too big of a head, not to become too arrogant. And he gave him that, that thorn in the flesh. Like I said, it's kind of a biblical mystery because we don't know what that thorn was. If he was spiritual in nature, maybe Paul was, was really susceptible to a certain sin. Maybe he really struggled with it and was becoming known. Maybe it was, it was opposition. Maybe it was a, a group of people or, or a single person who, who wrote against Paul, who, who preached against his message and, and was, was finding success in it. Maybe it was physical. Maybe it was a disability. Some people point to some clues in his letters that, that, that maybe indicate that he had poor eyesight or that he had weak hands. It was hard for him, hard for him to write. Whatever the problem was, it was, a, it was a big issue in Paul's life that held him back. And maybe, maybe it even impacted his ministry. So he prays three times. He prays, Lord, please take this weakness away. We see weakness as something to be avoided. We see weakness as something that, that's bad, something to, to remove from ourselves. And Paul saw it that way too. He said, Lord, take away my weakness and replace that with strength. We want that for ourselves, too, don't we? We know better than anyone else what our weaknesses are. You know what you struggle with. You know the areas in your life that, that you could improve on, the, the, the flaws in your personality or in your, your habits that you think, yes, this, this is an area that, that needs to get better. You know how those weaknesses have impacted you, and how they impact the people around you in your life. You think, you know, if God could just take this weakness away, if God could just remove this weakness, think about how much better my life would be. I could, I could worry less. And I could, I could have less stress in my life. I could be more successful. I could have a better self-image of who I am and, and, and what I can do. Life would be good if God would only make me more patient. Life could be so great if God would only make us when I was less lazy, if I was less prone to anger, right? If I could be less messy, if I could be more organized in my life, if I could be kinder to strangers, if I could be a better speaker, if my weaknesses would be replaced with strengths. How wonderful would that be? And in our human way of thinking, we think, why doesn't God want that for me too? Because if, if, if God replaces my weakness with strengths, I could be more faithful. If I was more zealous for the Lord, if I was less lazy, I could wake up half an hour earlier and, and spend that 30 extra minutes in God's Word in, in personal devotion time. If I was a better speaker, if I was more outgoing, I could approach people and tell them about their Savior. I could doubt less. I could sin less. If only God would make me strong. And it's in that, it's in sin that we get the nail on the head when it comes to weakness. Sin is the thing that, that, that really pulls back the covers and shows us how weak we are. We don't see it, we're blind to it until we read God's law, until we read His Word, which really shows us the standard that He has set and, and how far we've fallen, how far we are from uh, attaining that perfection. Scripture says that we are so weak when it comes to sin that we are actually slaves to it when we are apart from Christ. That we can't help but serve sin. Because that our hearts are, are only inclined towards evil. That even the best things that we do apart from faith are like filthy rags when it comes to our God. Think about how weak you are. Think about how it is impossible, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, to overcome sin. To be fair, sin is powerful. It hangs on every single person. Scripture says that there is no one righteous, not even one single person. And sin is so powerful that it has this ability to drive a wedge between us and God. Instead of this, this enormous barrier that we cannot cross, that we cannot climb, so we have, have no power or ability on our own to get from here, from the state of sinfulness, to our God. It was because of that that God sent 
Jesus. Not so he could reach that gap, not so he could climb that, that wall, so he could, could go across that separation, but so that God could come instead to us. And that's why Paul goes around hoping that no one focuses on how great he is. But Paul resolves to only preach Christ and him crucified for the sins of all people. It's interesting to think about why God sent Jesus. And to, to know in our upside down way of thinking, uh, to our minds, it wouldn't make sense for Jesus to come to make us strong, right? So it's interesting to, to see that, that, that God didn't send Jesus to take away our weaknesses. God didn't send us a, a Savior to make us strong. He sent us to, 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 to cover our sin, to redeem for us, to make up for the fact that we are weak and we will continue to be weak while we are in the flesh. He sent Jesus to atone for that sin, that weakness, and then to teach us to look at weakness in a different way. So Jesus is the solution to our weakness, right? He is the solution to our, our sin, our inability, our, our lack of strength to reach God. But he's also the ultimate example of what strength really looks like. Because think about Jesus. Think about his power. Right? He's, he's God. He's a creator of the world. All the power, might, and glory are his as he sits on the throne in heaven. And then he sets that all aside to be born as this little tiny human, weak baby. Throughout his life on earth, there's nothing about him that would make his friends and family there say, yeah, this guy's going to be great. If you read in our gospel text, they rejected him. Said, isn't, this, isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this the son of that carpenter? There's nothing special about him. There's nothing wonderful about him. There's nothing powerful about him. And now he's claiming to be this great and powerful Messiah. They rejected him. Jesus didn't know rich, earthly riches. He didn't have any political power. What he had was, was humility, a life of, of service. And then he died. And people, as we think about uh, sicknesses, people who are struggling with, with illness, when they finally pass away, they say that, that they lost the battle. That's what Jesus did on the cross to, to humanize. He lost the battle. He failed. He was too weak. His, his religious opponents, his political opponents were too strong. They, they put him on the cross for a crime he didn't commit, and then he died. And to humanize, it looks like weakness. And they called him out on it, too. They said, Jesus, if you're strong enough, just come down. If you are the Son of God, if you are powerful enough to say that, that or if you are powerful enough, and if you are who you say you are, get yourself off the cross and then smite everyone who has come against you. Like a lamb before the shears is silent, Jesus was silent before those accusers. He spoke nothing from the cross except for a few words about his mom, about, about forgiveness. To the world, Jesus died there because he was too weak not to. But through the eyes of faith, everything is different, isn't it? Through the revelation of God's word, we know that Jesus actually was on that cross because he was the only one strong enough to do it. And this weakness of Jesus, through the defeat of death, we truly only find strength. There's only victory over sin. There's only victory over death and the devil. In Jesus' death on the cross, there is only salvation for everyone who is weak enough to know that they need to put their trust and their hope in him. It's through this, this awesome gift of faith, this gift that we've been given by the Holy Spirit. It's through that gift that our eyes are open to the true strength of Jesus. And it's through that gift of faith that causes the, 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 the power of Jesus' weakness to rest on us. And since this is an upside-down kingdom of, of God in this world, it takes a little bit for us to comprehend the, the, the strength of Christ's weaknesses to rest on us. What does that mean? You look at baptism as the ultimate example of this. Right? If you think about a baby as they are brought to the font to be baptized, that baby is, is an infant. They need, they need everything done for them. They know nothing about the world. They don't understand the English language. So I can't tell them, and they, they understand, I can't tell them that, that, that they are sinful 
that Jesus is their Savior from sin, that he is God's own Son, that, that he is true man and true God, that, that we have a triune God, and for them to, to understand all of that with their mind. It's impossible for me to explain that to this child. Then they're brought to the font, and through that, that water which is given power by God's word, that child is given the gift of faith. That that infant who doesn't understand language now understands that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That Jesus died on the cross to save them from their sins. That they are uh, an heir of eternal life because of what Jesus has done for them. Through that sacrament, they are recreated. They are made anew. Think about that when it comes to yourself. You are baptized. Before that, in your inability to please God, in your weakness, God came to you. And he united, he united you to the power of Jesus' death and resurrection. He did this for you. You who were, were dead in your trespasses and sins. You who were God's enemy. You who were damned. You are now called God's own child. You are righteous. You are holy. You are an heir of heaven. And your weakness, it testifies to the power of God. Because look at what you were. And now through Christ, look at what you are. Paul saying most about that. He's saying celebrate your weaknesses, celebrate your inability, your faults, and your failures. Because even through those, God is still working through you. And in that weakness, any results that come about from your efforts, any success that you have in your life is a testimony to God's power in you and through you. But parents, who of us would not want to be more patient? Right? Which one of us would not want to, to pray for more ability to help our, our wimpy little kids get to the service? And as they become so quickly bored, as they whisper so incredibly loudly, as they, they wiggle so much, which of us would not pray for, for more strength to do that? We know as parents that we are so weak in so many areas of our parenting life. And yet, even through our weaknesses, God has loaned our children to us for a reason. Even through our weakness, God is working through us to bring those little ones Closer to him. So they're, they're grow Physical, spiritual, and in all ways. It's not because we're awesome parents. It's not because we've read the, the right parenting books and are doing the right methods with our children. Any growth that our kids have is because God even uses weak people like us to shape and mold his children. And we're here out of, out of everyone in our, in our fellowship hall. We would not pray for more boldness and more zeal when it comes to telling people about our Savior, to sharing the hope that we have. Who would not pray for, for the ability to preach like Paul? I can bring huge groups of people with us to church to make our, our sanctuary project completely obsolete because we have to build a bigger one because thousands of people are coming to Kingdom Grace every Sunday. Remember who God uses them. Remember the strengths of, of his chosen leaders. He uses people like Moses who couldn't even speak well. He uses people like, like Paul who have this, this thorn in the flesh that held him back. He uses mumbling, bumbling people like us. Paul reminds us, boast in your weaknesses. Because they are proof of our God's strength who works through us. Go around telling people, look, look at what I found have in my life. Look at my faith. Look at, look at my success. Look at the joy that is mine in my earthly life. Look at everything that I have. And then look how weak I am. Look at my, 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 my faults and my failures. Because when you see both of those things, then you will see how strong my God is. You will see how he has blessed me in my life. Your weaknesses aren't going anywhere. They're here to stay. We can improve, right? We can, we can get better in this life, but we will always be weak. Remember that weak does not equal 
worthless. Weak does not equal useless. God uses weak people like you. God uses weak people like me every single day. So our comfort here and now in this life is not in thinking that that in six months, in a year, in ten years, God's going to take this weakness away from me. I'm going to be able to to overcome this weakness and then I'm going to be strong and then life will be good. Jesus did not come to take away our weakness. He did not come to make us strong in and of ourselves. Our strength, our confidence, our hope comes from knowing that he tells us the truth. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My love for you is enough. My mercy, my forgiveness, my providence for you, that is all that you need in your life. Because my power is made perfect in weakness. Throughout your earthly life, when you are weak, when your trust and your reliance is not in yourself, but in your God, in His grace, in His salvation, in His power working in you, in you and in your life, when you are weak in Him, it is then that you are truly strong. Amen. Please rise to the blessing. The peace which surpasses all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We join together on page 9 in your bulletin with our next thing, Fight the Good Fight. <laughs> Provide for our land for your church to do its work 
in peace. Or part of that work of your church is to mourn with those who mourn, to comfort others with the same comfort that we ourselves have received from you. And so this morning we pray for that comfort on behalf of the Echoes. As Dorothy Cindy's mom has suffered a stroke in his hospital life. Comfort them with your promises and peace. Remind them that your grace is sufficient. Be with the doctors and the nurses and, and, and help uh, them make great decisions uh, on Dorothy's care. Lord, remind the Echoes and even Dorothy herself that if she loses the battle, that the battle can actually never be lost since the victory is already hers to be faith in Christ. Lord, we pray for that exact comfort for the, Gun the Gunderman family who is mourning the loss of Bruce. Remind them that your power is made perfect in weakness. That since Bruce's sins were covered and forgiven through Christ, we know that he will rise again, not in weakness, but in strength. And that his mortality will be clothed with immortality. That we will enjoy a reunion with him and all believers in your presence. Lord, throughout our life on earth, remind us all of our weaknesses. Through your law, show us how powerless we are and then remind us of your grace and your strength. For in this way, we will always know your power and strength in us. We thank you for making us your people. We ask that you would continue to do great things in us and through us, that your name may be praised all the more. In Jesus' name. We continue on page 9 for the service of the sacrament. Dear friends in Christ, in order that we may receive this holy sacrament worthily, it is good that we consider what we believe. From the words of Christ, this is my body, which is, this is my body, this is my blood. We believe that Jesus Christ is himself present with his body and blood, as the words declare. From Christ's words, for the forgiveness of sins, we believe that Jesus Christ gives us his body and blood to actually deliver to us the forgiveness of all our sins. And finally, we do as Christ commands when he says, Take, eat, drink of it all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. We also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for so great a gift. And then love one another with a pure heart. And thus, with the whole Christian church, have comfort and joy in Christ our Lord. To this end, may God the Father grant us his grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever.
crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who has now given you his holy body and blood, the means by which he has made full payment for all of your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith of the life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen.
Let's give thanks and pray. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, that you have refreshed us with these your life-giving gifts. We ask you out of your mercy to strengthen us through them in faith toward you and meager love for one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you. 